Hello everyone, happy Friday the 13th and welcome to today's webinar, Micro Sustainability, a Primer for Local Impact. Uh, this webinar is presented by the Education and Business Programs Office of UC Irvine Extension and uh, I'm very glad to see you all here today. Thank you very much for joining us. So this session is going to be recorded and the archive will be available within 24 hours. If you signed up for this webinar through UC Irvine Extension's free events website, you'll automatically receive an emailed link to this recording once it's posted. If for any reason you don't receive that link, you can access this archive manually by going to uci.webex.com, clicking on the Event Center tab, and then selecting View Event Recordings. A lot of webinars will be listed on there, but simply search for the title of this webinar, Micro Sustainability, uh, and you will see that on the list. My name is Daniel Powers. I'm the program representative for the Sustainable Solutions and Practices Certificate Program here at UCI Extension. Today I'm speaking on behalf of my director, Angela Jante. Here's a brief overview of what we'll be covering in today's webinar session. Uh, first, I'll be giving a brief overview of the key features of WebEx so that you'll know how to submit questions through the presentation. After that, I'll give some information about UC Irvine's uh, Sustainable Solutions and Practices Certificate Program, including the program I'm offering for winter 2014, which begins in January. Then I'm going to turn it over to our presenter today, Antonia Castro-Graham, and at the end of Antonia's presentation, we'll have time for a brief Q&A session. Uh, finally, after that, I'll reiterate the contact information if you have any questions, comments, concerns that we did not address during the webinar. If you encounter any technical difficulties during this webinar, please send a chat message to UCI Eric, uh, and he will help you to troubleshoot any issues that you have. Uh, if you have any questions for Antonia regarding the content of this presentation, go ahead and submit those in either the Q&A box or the chat panel, and we'll address those questions at the end of the session if there is time. Uh, the chat panel should show up on the right side of your screen. When you send a chat message, uh, make sure you send it to both host and panelists to ensure that I, as well as Antonio, will receive that question. Uh, you can also submit your question into the Q&A panel, as shown on this slide. So about the Sustainable Practices and Solutions Certificate Program, it's an entirely online program and it focuses on understanding and applying the best and newest practices in sustainability at both the community and the global level. Uh, this is an interdisciplinary program which provides a wide spectrum field of study. It integrates the fields of sustainable development, sociological awareness, environmentalism, sustainable business management, leadership, and sustainability reporting to enhance or prepare for a career in the growing field of sustainability. The certificate program itself consists of five required courses listed here, uh, macro sustainability, micro sustainability, corporate social responsibility, framework for strategic leadership, and sustainability reporting. You must complete all these courses with a grade of C or better, as well as complete a candidacy uh, declaration form. It is recommended that a student takes two or three classes before uh, applying for that candidacy to make sure the full program is one they want to commit to. And at the end of the program, student must complete the request for certification. And of course, all classes must be completed within five years of the first class. The estimated cost for the entire program is roughly $3,500. This price does not include textbooks or a one-time candidacy declaration fee of $125. Uh, there is no additional cost for the certificate at the end of the program. There are also some financial aid options available, and to learn about those, you can contact Student Services, the contact information of which I'll share with you momentarily. So winter 2014 is the upcoming quarter. That's the one that begins in January. Registration for that is open right now. Uh, we're offering another core course in the series uh, of this new program, which is the Micro Sustainability Local Impact. Uh, if that sounds familiar, it's because the webinar today is a functional preview of that course, and the class will be taught by today's presenter, uh, Antonia Castro-Graham. 
Uh, so the micro sustainability class focuses on community level prog problems and actions that can be taken to ameliorate the threats to our immediate ecosystems. Uh, topics will include consumer behavior, transportation and food challenges, green marketing, greenwash, sustainability of built environments, energy consumption, waste management, sustainability plans, and much, much more. So again, that class will begin on January 6th. You can register for that right now. Uh, you can call Student Services at 949-824-5414. You can also register online at extension.uci.edu. Uh, for information about the rest of the classes, you can also call that number, or you can call my number directly, and that information will be at the end of the webinar. So I'm going to hand over the show to today's panelist, uh, Antonia Castro-Graham, uh, and she's going to be speaking with us about micro-sustainability and uh, local impact. So uh, Antonia, if you wouldn't mind starting with a little bit about yourself, a little bit of background and your credentials, and uh, then you can jump right into it. Great. Thank you, Daniel. Can everyone hear me? I hope so. I have a master's degree in public administration and over a decade of experience working for municipalities, both large and small, and for the Metropolitan Water District. I recently accepted a position with the Port of Long Beach, where I will be handling uh, similar programs and managing capital improvement projects. I am constantly learning new things about uh, sustainability. This is an ever-evolving field, and you can never uh, learn too many things. So with that, I will start our webinar. I'd like to thank you for joining me this morning, and I hope that you find this informative. Uh, this webinar will provide you with an overview of our um, micro-sustainability online course, and like Daniel mentioned, you can register for it now, and it is available uh, starting in January. There really is some truth to the adage of thinking globally, acting locally. Uh, we live in a time where our population is growing, which thereby increases our consumption of food, resources, and puts further strain on our existing infrastructure. We need to learn to reduce, conserve, and plan for a sustainable future at the local level. Sustainability starts with individual change, and you can enact that change by acting locally and serving as a role model for your fellow employees, fellow residents, you know, for your community at large. A perfect example of a grassroots sustainable practice that started locally and has spread globally is recycling. Uh, it started at the local community level. It was meant to um, help people with a income and has spread so that every community in the United States practically recycles and worldwide. Understanding sustainability challenges at a global level is crucial to the expansion of practices and solutions, which are rightly done at a local level in beginning stages. This is just a, a funny cartoon that I thought I'd share. Uh, it comes from is sustainabilitypossible.org. Um, could this be a way to survive if sustainability is no longer possible? This is an ad for a an ecopod that could help you with sustainability and in your own lifestyle. Uh, today, unfortunately, the term sustainable more typically lends itself to the corporate behavior called greenwashing, which we will talk more in depth in the online course this winter. Phrases like sustainable design, sustainable cars, litter the media and pro product markets. Uh, Robert Engelman, he is the president of the World Watch Institute, and he re recently wrote in a book called Sustainability, Is It Still Possible?, that the term sustainable has become synonymous for the equally vague and unquantifiable adjective green, suggesting some undefined environmental value as in green growth or green jobs. Uh, this is something you see everywhere. You see that you know businesses are eco-friendly, uh, products are green, but what really does that mean? Is it someone just slapping a label on something and greenwashing a, a product or a service to get some, you know, people to uh, buy into their service or product by using that terminology? What does sustainability really mean and how can it be achieved on the local level? 
This class will delve into the topic of sustainability and students will be able to understand the various components that make up a sustainability plan and how starting at the local level can truly make a difference. It is true. By thinking globally, you must act locally. By implementing change in your own personal life, you can spread that into your business, into your community, and that then spreads to a statewide level, to a federal level, and nationwide, and thinking globally. A major part of, this, part of this class will include creating a sustainability plan, whether it be a plan for your own personal lifestyle, your employer, a city, a county, what have you. Um, a sustainability plan really should include the following items. First of all, a definition of sustainability that is defined by your organization, your community, et cetera. This might look different to an individual. It might look different to a Fortune 500 company, or it might look different to a community. It really just depends. Secondly, it should include a description of any relevant state laws. In California, we see a lot of sustainability plans that deal with AB 32, the uh, landmark greenhouse gas bill that was signed by Governor Schwarzenegger. We also see water conservation laws. We see mandatory recycling. Um, there's lots of regulatory laws in California and at the federal level that you must include in your sustainability plan if you want to make sure that you can obtain grants and if you can make sure that it is legally defensible, if need be, if it's tied to your general plan. Uh, thirdly, you would want um, sustainability policy areas. These are basically identific identification and description of policy areas that your plan will address. They will include a focused set of goals, policies, and actions. These focused set of sustainability goals, policies, and actions will really define your plan and will help you, um, as you by using them as a measurement tool of how you will measure your success. What benchmarks are you going to set? How will you know if you are really achieving the goals that you set out in your sustainability plan? First, you must define what sustainability means to you, your organization, or your community. The definition will guide your plans, goals, and format of your plan. Will your definition incorporate the triple bottom line, which is people, planet, profit? Or will it also include the three E's of economy, equity, and environment? Your definition will guide your plan and serve as the framework for your goals. You see a lot of sustainability plans that are set up by using these three E's. Uh, and what are they? The environment, environmental sustainability is achieved by being a steward of the natural environment and reducing the impact of human activities on natural resources and systems that support the community. Economy, a sustainable economy is one that is strong and resilient. It is achieved by supporting education, jobs, businesses, green industries, innovation, and economic development. And finally, equity. A sustainable community is one that is accessible, healthy, safe, and diverse and promotes well-being. It is achieved by supporting public participation, healthy living, access to social services, cultural diversity, historic preservation, and the arts. By combining all of these things, you will have a holistic sustainability plan that should be able to achieve many different goals and serve as a model for others. So how are you going to come up with these goals? How are you going to come up with your definition? How are you going to come up with how you're going to measure and what policy areas you're going to include in your sustainability plan? It all comes down to one word, input. You really need to solicit input from stakeholders to guide your framework and goals. The input could be received from a variety of sources and in a variety of ways. Depending on the scale of your sustainability plan, you could hold community forums, workplace workshops, 
have a variety of survey methods. But the bottom line is, no matter what method you use, input is extremely important and can be solicited and or welcomed throughout the process. So your sustainability plan really should have input at, on all steps from the beginning of when you are deciding what policies and what plans you want to incorporate to really deciding what are the goals, the guiding goals and the focus goals. Input will be necessary once the draft is completed, that way it can be incorporated, but it will also be solicited when your plan is being implemented because things may work and things may not work and you may want to tweak your plan. Sustainability plans really should be viewed as working documents, and no two are ever the same because no community and no organization is the same. Sustainability has been a nebulous concept with competing definitions and frameworks. There isn't a national standard by which to measure sustainability performance at the municipal or county scale. But by setting general goals, you frame your plan to meet your needs. A focus goal identifies many goals that help you achieve your guiding goal. So what you ask are guiding goals and focus goals. A guiding goal would be a high quality of life for all residents. Well, what does that mean? You use, then, the focus goal to achieve your guiding goal. So a focus goal to achieve the guiding goal of a high quality of life for all residents would be to have a pattern of land use which enhances the community character, provides employment and shopping opportunities to serve residents and the region, which provides for use of transit, which protects natural features. In 2010, ICLE, which stands for the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives, established goals and guiding principles. They are also known as STAR. These goals and principles give local governments the tools to accelerate their efforts and achieve greater success. Many communities and many organizations are now using these ICLE standard goals, but tweaking them with guided goals to make sure that they fit the needs of their organization or their community. You could even include long-term and short-term goals. The bottom line is to make your plan fit your organization or your community. How do you use your goals? Your goals are going to be used to create or revise your sustainability plan. And like I mentioned before, your sustainability plan is a, is a fluid document, a working document that will never really be finalized because you're always going to be changing it. You're going to change it when you meet your certain goals. You're going to change it if something is not working. You're going to change it if the needs of your community or organization change. You'll also use your goals to conduct a sustainability assessment. This will be wanting to know what things are working and what isn't working. Your goals will establish local priorities. No community is the same. Your priorities will be different. No organization is the same. Again, your priorities will be different. Focus on ongoing sustainability measures. Sustainability is an evolving topic, and we will never truly be 100% sustainable unless we continue to change. We continue to change our sustainability measures and continue to change our goals because our, our world is evolving. You really want to create policies and partnerships that integrate the components of your sustainability plan into the decision-making process. This will lead to well-informed choices that take into consideration the fundamental links between the economy, the environment, and the community. These connections will help foster your focus goals. Partner with public and private agencies to efficiently enforce your plan. Participate in local, regional, and statewide sustainability efforts and programs that further the goals and policies outlined in your plan. Here are some sample sustainability topic areas that will be covered in the upcoming online course. This is just a small example that we'll talk about today in our webinar. The course will cover more in depth these topics and many others. First, energy. Your sustainability plan could have a chapter developed solely to energy. Is that consumption, impacts, and conservation of the types of energy that your community or your organization may use? 
how can you save energy? How can you conserve or how can you switch to a different energy source? Solid waste and recycling, I personally think this is a one of the most important areas of a sustainability plan. Water, which includes water reuse, stormwater, and water supply, and definitely water quality. And then the built environment, which includes transportation, green buildings, smart growth principles, and low impact development. So energy conservation and consumption. This could definitely be a chapter in your sustainability plan and one that we will talk about in depth in our online course. Increased energy efficiency and the use of renewable energy sources contribute to reduce dependence on fossil fuels for heat and power and lessen concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The use of alternative energy sources contribute to more stable local economies due to decreased reliance on traditional energy sources whose economic future is uncertain. Your plan could include a number of initiatives with each a guiding goal and a focus goal. For example, the City of San Diego recently implemented a sustainability plan which called for energy conservation and included that all city employees will be aware of and implement energy conservation measures. One of their goals was to reduce energy usage by 10% by 2012 using 2000 as a baseline. What this means is that they looked at their energy consumption in the year 2000 and wanted to reduce that by 10%. They also included renewable energy as a guiding goal. What they wanted to do was increase the megawatts of renewable energy used at city facilities to 25% by 2020. They also wanted to continue the use of the electronic data interchange, which was from San Diego Gas and Electric. Another focus goal that they had was policy development and implementation in regards to energy conservation. They wanted to guide city efforts by institutionalizing policies and programs that increase energy conservation, efficiency, and the use of renewable energy. And finally, they stated that they wanted to leverage their resources ensure that state and federal funds are leveraged to the extent possible with existing programs such as the California Energy Commission loans and the California Public Utilities Commission partnership. Their plan also called for a partnership with the CPUC and San Diego Gas and Electric on a program called Energy Upgrade California. This is just an example of a topic area that you could include in your sustainability plan. And no organization or agency will have the same energy portfolio. So this is definitely an area that will be different in every sustainability plan. Now let's talk trash. Solid waste and recycling, in my opinion, is probably one of the most essential elements of a sustainable sustainability plan, especially in areas where landfills are closing. In Southern California, especially in LA County, there is one public landfill left. With the closure of Puente Hills in October, you see more and more areas in California and like LA County that need proper places to put their waste. Well, why not just reduce and reuse and recycle instead of having waste as the final resting place in a landfill? By, way, by utilizing waste reduction and incorporating this in your sustainability plan, you will help extend the life of our landfills, which produces many environmental benefits. Now, the adage of reduce, reuse, and recycle is definitely important. We should first reduce material consumption. By doing that, we avoid significant negative impacts upstream and downstream from the consumer at all life cycle stages. Your sustainability plan could include many facets of the solid waste and recycling field. It really, again, depends on where you are, where is your organization, or where is your municipality or community. You could have a zero waste goal or set your goals to meet incremental diversion goals of 50%, 75%, and perhaps eventually zero waste. You may also include extended producer responsibility language and want to work with businesses to reduce waste. There have been two shifts in the history of recycling. 
first, there was a shift away from the focus on waste as a panacea, something that could save the environment and or provide job opportunities for the desperately poor. Instead, waste became treated as a commodity that could generate revenue. And you see here in this picture, this is a picture of a materials recovery facility where waste is recycled and bailed because it has now become a commodity that generates revenue. Second, there was a shift away from recycling which, as an activity in which marginalized social groups and community-based organizations engaged toward its control by large firms, many of which now operate in global markets. Recycling is big business now. This material and material like this are now shipped off in containers to China and other nations for processing to make into different materials. Another reason I think that this is such an important aspect to include in your sustainability plan is because recycling constitutes a model of sustainable community development in two ways. First, recycling is one of the few common elements in discussions among scholars, policymakers, and activists concerned with sustainable community development. Recycling is almost always raised in an important part of a community's transition towards sustainable community development. It is also one of the very few ideas proposed by advocates that embraces all of the three E's, environment, economy, and equity, which is why I think that this is probably one of the most essential elements of a sustainability plan and one of the easiest to set up because the infrastructure to head towards zero waste is already in place for the most part. This is an aspect that we will talk about more in depth in the class. We will talk about different methods of recycling, um, and then definitely the zero waste movement. There are many communities that are heading towards zero waste and are very close to achieving it. And we'll also talk about extended producer responsibility. That is, getting the producer of materials to create a material that does not have an end of life, that it can be useful, and that can also pay for the disposal if need be. A key topic to include in sustainability plan is that of water. Our worldwide growing population and increasing demand for more water is causing many regions around the globe to face the hard realities of groundwater depletion, chronic drought, dried up rivers, poor water quality, mounting infrastructure costs, and diminishing alternatives for additional supplies. These constraints are placing limits on how much water will be available and affordable. The example here that you see that I'm illustrating is California, and California is no different. Our water supply issues are diverse and varied depending on the area of the state. And Southern California especially relies on a variety of sources. In Southern California, we rely on the Colorado River Aqueduct, which is experiencing another year of drought, the State Water Project, which draws water from the Sacramento and San Joaquin Delta area, which is under an environmental drought, whereas the southern, we cannot pump as much water as we used to because of a small fish called the Delta smelt. And then we also have local supplies, the LA Aqueduct, which draws river, water from the Owens River. And then we also have local supplies of groundwater, which we are seeing a depletion of. Um, in Southern California, we do a lot of recycling of water and desalination. In recent years, conventional approaches to water supply master planning only considered supply side options to meet increased demand. This planning model needs to change and should be included in your sustainability plan. Your plan should include conservation and demand management as potential alternatives for meeting future demands. California water today. There's the LA Aqueduct, the Colorado River Aqueduct, and our local supplies. In order to keep pace with our growing population, we must implement conservation measures. Conservation has been historically viewed by the mainstream water industry as a standby or temporary source of supply that is typically invoked during times of drought or other temporary emergency water shortages. This is an outdated view that must change. 
Water supply reliability and sustainability is necessary if we are to build a water trust, an endowment that generations to come can rely on for their own security and prosperity by exercising greater stewardship to preserve our water supplies for the future. Depending on your exact water needs in your area, the water section of your sustainability plan may include conservation, reuse, recycling, or other reliability issues. This is an area of your plan that will need input from stakeholders, the community, and the will, and will need to incorporate any existing regulatory language regarding conservation, water quality, or other recharge efforts. Another section to include is the built environment or building. The concept of sustainable development was popularized by the World Commission on Environment and Development, a United Nations entity usually referred to as the Brooklyn Commission. In 1987, the commission issued a report that defined sustainable development as those forms of development that allow people to meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Green building techniques are an effective way of reducing the environmental impacts created by development, and green buildings have been shown to use significantly less energy than traditional buildings. By incorporating this element into your sustainability plan, you will demonstrate leadership in promoting sustainable development for both the built environment. Some examples of focus goals to help you achieve the guiding goal of incorporating green building techniques and best management practices in the site design, construction, and renovation of all projects would be to require all municipal developments to exceed existing green building codes for your state. And in California, we have such a, a building code. We have something called CalGreen. CalGreen is basically the California green building standards. Another section that you could include in your built environment of your sustainability plan would be to incorporate low impact development. What is low impact development? Well, it takes into account the existing site and it works with nature to manage stormwater as close to its source as possible. The problem that we see in many communities throughout the United States is that we have built up so much that we have taken the natural environment that was pervious and have put buildings and concrete and asphalt and created impervious surfaces where water cannot percolate into the ground and instead runs off, carrying all sorts of pollutants that are on the ground into the storm drains, which eventually wind up into our waterways and cause flooding because they have, um, you have overburdened channels and overburdened rivers because they don't, the ground is not having the opportunity to soak up runoff. Low impact development employs principles such as preserving and recreating, uh, I'm sorry, recreating natural landscape features, minimizing effective imperviousness to create functional and appealing site drainage that treats stormwater as a resource rather than a waste product. Low impact development includes bioretention facilities, like you see in the picture below, rain gardens, vegetated rooftops, rain barrels, and permeable pavements. This is also an area that is heavily regulated. It is regulated by the Clean Water Act and the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permit process. You are seeing now more and more in NPDES permits the requirement to include low impact development in all new development and significant redevelopment that is usually 5,000 square feet or more. Another aspect of the built environment is transportation. You could include in your plan transit-oriented development. TOD is a type of community development that includes a mixture of housing, office, retail, and other amenities integrated into a walkable neighborhood and located within a half a mile of quality public transportation. You're beginning to see a lot of this. It's also known as something called smart growth. At Reconnecting America, um, an organization that really supports transit-oriented development. They believe it's essential to create better access to jobs, housing, and opportunity for people of all ages and incomes to have access to public transportation. Successful TOD provides people from all walks of life with convenient, affordable, and active lifestyles, and really creates places where our children can play and parents can grow old comfortably, knowing that transportation and access to services are close by. 
Some benefits of TOD include reduced household driving, which equals lower regional congestion, air pollution, and greenhouse gas emissions, walkable communities that accommodate more healthy and active lifestyles, increased transit ridership and fare revenue, potential for added value through increased and or sustained property values where transit investments have occurred, improved access to jobs and economic opportunity for low-income people and working families, expanded mobility choices that reduce dependence on the automobile, reduce transportation costs, and free up household income for other purposes. In doing my research on transit-oriented development, it makes you wonder, is this the end of the suburb? Are more and more people moving back into cities because they have these smart growth principles in place and there is more transit and more services available to them? It's really something to ponder when you are plan making your sustainability plan. Is your plan going to be geared for the urban lifestyle and the urban um, atmosphere, or is it going to be more rural? These are things you'll have to take into account, because remember, no plan is the same. So how do you implement your plan? You need to create an implementation plan, and it should include the following elements. Who is going to be responsible? Who are the responsible parties? What are the costs of implementation? This may change your plan significantly. If your organization doesn't have a lot of money to uh, implement the plan, this may change what some of your goals are. The potential energy and greenhouse gas benefits, this could be something that could help you offset your costs. If you're saving um, energy costs, you would be able to implement some other uh, measures. The potential funding sources, are there grants out there that can help you implement your plan? the timeline for implementation, and any additional co-benefits. You could have your plan tiered so that in 10 years you meet a, cer a certain target, in 20 years you meet a certain target, or you could have even shorter goals. Your implementation plan, most importantly, should include public outreach. Your plan will become a document on a shelf if you do not include public outreach and advertise your plan. Your outreach should include public workshops, community forums, and don't be afraid to use media, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, the web, email blasts, and even print. There is still value to print, especially for older residents. And door-to-door. -door. Face to face is extremely important. You really should remember that you cannot manage what you do not measure. Some sustainability metrics are straightforward. For example, you might want to reduce solid waste by 20% over five years. How, though, do we track progress in, say, sustaining biological diversity, if that's something you wish to include in your plan? With so much uncertainty about causes and rates of extinct extinction, it would be much harder to find the set point for biodiversity as opposed to measuring solid waste reduction, which is easily quantifiable. So in assessing your plan, you would want to create a formalized assessment that measures the success in achieving sustainability targets that you have set forth. You'd want to establish a working group that monitors the progress and stays informed of current best management practices. Your working group will identify sustainability indicators, develop measurable targets, research best management practices and provide links to other professional association BMPs on your website or other PubMed materials. You'd want to participate in conferences and meetings that promote sustainability where you can learn and you can spread your message. And you want to annually assess and report on these targets and indicators that monitor your plan's progress towards sustainability and make recommendations based on current best practices and innovation. You may find in your annual assessment that things are working or things aren't working and that's where you change your plan, change your focus, change your guiding goals. Developing your metrics will be an evolutionary process, an objective to work toward and use for accountability in the long conversation ahead toward sustainable futures. You might want to even create a report card that highlights progress and identifies areas that need a more concentrated focus to achieve your goals. Remember, again, this is a living document and will change. Do not get discouraged if after a year you realize some goals are not achievable. Perhaps they just need some reworking.
Once you've created your plan, measured your plans, goals, and objectives, received buy-in from the community, it's now time to move from individual change to societal change. Picking up litter, biking to work, using reusable bags are all great. By doing these things, we demonstrate our concern to others, hopefully providing inspiration to others to exact change. Reviewing history and looking back at case studies where change has happened, it seems that change almost always involves at least three things. First, there is the big idea of how change can be better. To move people beyond the easy green actions, we need to put forward an inspiring, morally compelling, powerful, and inviting vision comparable to that in transformative social movements of the past. Live your plan. Inspire others to change their, beh their behavior. This will inspire broader change. Second, there needs to be a commitment to move beyond individual action. Once we have a compelling vision, we need to join with others to build the necessary power to make it real. And finally, action must follow. Right now, there is a high percentage of people in most cases place a significant majority that support a cleaner environment and safer products. You are not alone. Other people have the same mentality. The good news is that we have everything in place to make change in the years ahead. We have model policies and laws. We have innovative technologies, and most importantly, we have an educated and informed public that know we have a problem and want a better future for their children. Margaret Mead said it best, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. I'd like to wrap up this webinar by seeing if anyone has any questions. And for more information on sustainable solutions and practices uh, program, please visit the website below. And remember, we have not inherited the earth from our fathers. We are borrowing it from our children. I hope you'll register for this class and hope that you've learned something from this short webinar. Like I said before, sustainability plans are always evolving. And this class will teach you how to write your own plan and to exact change. Excellent. Thank you so much, Antonia. Uh, so uh, we don't have any questions in the Q&A box right now, uh, but if, if anyone watching this or the recording of this does have any questions, uh, the email address on the screen is one that you can write to directly, and those questions will come to me. I'll make sure they get answered um, and send them over to Antonia, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll get all your questions answered if you think of any uh, along the way. Uh, oh, we do have a Q&A. One second. Uh, it sounds like a great course, and I bet your experience working with municipalities will add a lot of value. Uh, will you be sharing any specific lessons learned from your experience? Uh, yes, definitely. I have, um, in a municipality that I worked for, I um, started a green business program. It became one of the first in Orange County, uh, but it was not easy to achieve. Um, I'll also talk about the different conservation measures and recycling programs that I've started, and I have many case studies from many colleagues, so definitely this will be um, shared. Uh, part of the class will include a great deal of um, case studies and analysis, and you know, we're not just going to talk about success stories. We're going to talk about things that didn't work and, and what could have been done differently. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, so again, uh, we'll wrap up now uh, on that note. Uh, if you do have any other questions uh, for Antonia, again, send those my way. Or if you have any questions about the program, I'd be happy to answer those myself. Uh, the contact information for myself uh, is on the screen right now, as well as my uh, program director, Angela Jante. Uh, if for any reason you want to send us snail mail, that address is also on the screen right now. Uh, so make note of that and send us anything that you need answered. Uh, so, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up today. Again, if anyone has any other questions, send those over. Otherwise, uh, have a happy and safe holiday season, and uh, we'll catch you on the next webinar. Uh, have a great day, everybody, and thank you again, Antonia. Thank you. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.